Good evening. I'm Juan Rivero, Special Projects Director for Villas Preservation. And I wanted to welcome you and to remind you that the past is never dead. It is not even past. We subscribe to these words penned famously by William Faulkner, but while we believe that the past is not dead, we also believe that it needs a little shot in the arm every now and then. And that is the reason for our historic plaque program, to remind us of momentous events that transpired right where we're standing, of remarkable individuals who walked the streets before us, including the one that brings us here tonight, Charles Mingus. A monumental figure in American music who lived, performed, and composed in this neighborhood. And so to celebrate the unveiling of the plaque in his honor, we have wonderful guests who will speak to us about his music, his legacy, and his life. But before uh, we get to them, we're going to hear a few words from our executive director, Village Preservation's executive director, Andrew Berman. Thank you so much, Juan. And uh, welcome, everybody. What a perfect day for a joyous event like this. Uh, so happy to see so many people here, old familiar faces, new ones, um, all gathered to celebrate a monumental figure of 20th century American music, Charles Mingus, who, like so many other amazing innovators um, and trailblazers, lived, worked, performed, and changed the world from these neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods, Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo, are the neighborhoods that we exist to document, to celebrate, and to help preserve. And we do, thank you very much. Uh, and we do that in a variety of ways, everything from earning landmark designation for more than 1,250 buildings in our neighborhood, to zoning protections for nearly 100 blocks, to make sure that as our neighborhoods and our city grows and changes, it does so in a way that respects our past and our history builds on the best of what came before it as we create our future in a way that's consistent with the irreplaceable character of places like these. And that's a lot of work. And if you want to get more involved with that work or support that work, please take uh, the literature that I think is being handed out uh, to everybody here. You can get more involved in uh, village preservation and the work that we do. One of the many things that we do is this plaque program, which is now in its, we're entering our 12th year. This is our 22nd plaque. And those plaques really focus on innovators and people who challenged the status quo. And certainly somebody like Charles Mingus embodies those qualities. Uh, some of the other folks who we've uh, memorialized with plaques just a couple of blocks away, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Oh. <laughs> little sneak preview there, unplanned. Um, a little further west, uh, Jane Jacobs. Uh, Crosstown, uh, Allen Ginsberg uh, and um, uh, William Burroughs. The Fillmore East, Julius's Bar in the West Village, the home of Anais Nin and artist Frank Stella, and poet Frank O'Hara. So that's really just the tip of the iceberg of the people who've really changed the course of history from our neighborhoods. And we are humbled and proud to be able to help perpetuate that legacy and to make sure that the incredibly important work that they did to expand our horizons, to make our world a broader, more inclusive, more dynamic and more creative place is something that we never forget. And that we never forget the struggles that were involved in the people who did that, because that work is not easy. And that's part of what we're here to memorialize today. So uh, I'm gonna hand the microphone over because the folks here who knew Charles Mingus, who continue to um, share his legacy through music, 
can, can express what he's about much more eloquently than I can. But I just want to thank you all for being here today and for helping us to celebrate and perpetuate this incredibly important part of our neighborhood's history. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You know, uh, people are surprised to learn that one of the challenges of the historic plaque program is getting building owners to agree to let us put a plaque on their building. Because you'd figure, why would you not want to celebrate your noteworthy historical associations? So we appreciate building owners who, who are interested in our program. This case went well beyond that. We could not have received a more enthusiastic or helpful response than we did from the folks at Five Great Jones. So to make a few remarks on their behalf is Clifford Hervich. Hello? I'm Clifford. Hello? Can you hear me? All right. So I'm just going to say a few words about uh, the history of the building and some things that, are, that I know of personally that are at least tangentially related to Charles Minkus. I'm Clifford Hervich a member of the Five Great Jones Street Tenants Corporation. My wife, Maria Elena, and I inherited our shares to the unit on the top floor from my mother, Phyllis Krim, an artist who painted there from 1968 to 2010. She was attracted to the neighborhood by its vibrant arts community and to the unit itself by the light streaming in from a rooftop skylight. My mother knew many local artists and musicians, including Charles Mingus, Miriam McCabe, David Amram, Bette Midler, Alfred Leslie, Faith Ringgold, Alice Neal, and Louise Bourgeois. Though the Five Great Jones Street Tenants Corporation eventually secured a certificate of occupancy and renovated the building, the situation in the late 1960s was much more tenuous. My mother told me that the building was run by an absentee landlord and that there was no bathroom in the unit. In a scene from the film Mingus, Charlie Mingus, 1968, he pulls on a window shade in his Five Great Jones Street unit and the entire shade falls on him. Artists find a way to thrive in difficult conditions. And it's notable that Five Great Jones Street played a role in the history of Sesame Street, as Kermit Love, a longtime tenant, helped to create the large Muppets in his studio there. In February 1965, my mother organized a benefit concert at the Village Gate and invited several luminary figures to perform, including Miriam McCabe and Charles Mingus. The benefit was for my elementary school, the Downtown Community School, at 235 East 11th Street, where Ms. McCabe was a parent and Pete Seeger had been the music teacher during the period when he was blacklisted. The school was focused on racial integration and civil rights and the benefit concert was to support their scholarship program. I do not know if there's any recording of the show there, but I do have photos of the evening, as well as letters from my mother to Ms. McCabe and Mr. Mingus, thanking them for their performances. Though the 1960s are in the past, we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude to the artists and activists who toiled in those days. And it is fitting to commemorate those who lived and worked here specifically the great musician, performer, and innovator, Charles Mingus. Thank you. Writer, performer, and producer, Janet Coleman met Charles Mingus when she was still a student at the University of Michigan and remained his lifelong friend uh, until Mingus passed away, uh, authoring a memoir 
Mingus Mingus, co-authored by late poet Al Young. She's currently the co-host of uh, Cat Radio Cafe at WBAI with her husband, David Dozen. David. Thank you. Well, I was 17 when I met Mingus. I met him in Detroit, of all places. I was going to school in Ann Arbor, and he was playing with a band of five, I think, at a place called the Minor Key. After it was over, we, I was there actually on a Friday night, and as soon as the challah was cut and put away and the prayers were said, I told my friend whom I was visiting, let's go downtown to Detroit and see Mingus at the Minor Key. I'd heard about him because he played in the village. He played all over New York. Everybody was listening under the covers to uh, late at night to Symphony Sid to catch some of Mingus's tunes. Well, we had a long discussion after the two sets were over and we agreed to exchange addresses. We wrote to each other and then on school vacations, I would visit Mingus. The story of his, his schools, Mingus was, uh, I mean, he was super, super larger than life. Larger than death, as we have come to find out. He was a giant spirit of the arts. He was a musician, a composer, a writer. Um, and a, he would do drawings and cartoons. He made films. He was the universal artist in a way, and he was very anxious to have a school where artists could uh, communicate with each other in a, in a, you know, a supportive environment. The first loft he found was on 3rd Avenue and 27th Street, and he brought his son, Charles Mingus III, in to help him decorate. And the way they decorated it was to go into a, a closing down Jack LaLanne studio. Jack LaLanne was a muscle man who uh, had, you know, gyms around New York. And they cleared the floor at the Jack LaLanne uh, spa or, <laughs> and uh, exercise room and brought all these pieces to 27th Street and 3rd Avenue. They dug a real pit in the floor so that they could, to, I guess, support these uh, humongous pieces of uh, furniture. He had planned to have a karate teacher there named Charles Rice, his friend, the dancer, Catherine Dunham, who was gonna teach not just dance, but witchcraft, and himself and his, uh, and other musicians to sort of create. Well, he was evicted from that loft before too long, and he complained rather bitterly that he wasn't smart enough to learn how to, to pay off the cops properly, and it was a thorn in his side until he found Five Great Jones Street several years later, where I think he also had aspirations to start a school. I don't think that worked out. He was eventually... Well, he booby-trapped the whole loft, let's put it that way. He had guns, he had a big flashlight, like big floodlights to turn on in case he heard anybody tapping on his windows, whatever it was. It was a sort of combination of creativity and paranoia that, <laughs> that schooled him through this period. But I want everybody to know that he was evicted from 5 Great Jones Street, and the circumstances of his eviction are explored in a fabulous movie that the gentleman uh, just mentioned called, um, his called Mingus, did you say Mingus 68? It was Mingus, Charles Mingus 68. And it tells the story of the inner turmoil of Mingus during that period. He was upset, you know, in a state of, uh, you know, social, that we were in a state of social unrest. He was distressed about the Vietnam War and there are uh, bits of film in that a wonderful film by Tom Reichman, uh, who was an up-and-coming documentary and documentary filmmaker, who also later uh, did, uh, directed Marjo, I think, and several other documentaries. But it was a much admired documentary. And in it, you see Mingus in all these guns. You see him entertaining his little daughter, Carolyn Mingus, 
at the piano, teaching her how to play the piano, this strange combination of, of rage and love and tenderness. Anyway, after, there were so many places in the village where we could plaque Charles Mingus. He was, I remember him seeing these bikes go by. I remember him riding on a bike past my house on the other Jones Street and uh, carrying, I don't know, he just was carrying a bouquet of flowers. He saw me, gave me the bouquet of flowers and rode merrily on his way. That was the way you saw giants walking the earth back then. Anyway, um, I, can't, I, I can't say enough of, about what that relationship to this deep and profound uh, musician and thinker and feeler, what, how he affected my life. I mean, there's a, 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 across the street is a place where the Mingus Band, big band played for years. It was called the, uh, what was it called, Frank? <laughs> It was, a it was the fe Fez Under the Time Cafe. First time I ever saw Frank Lacey who was playing there. And um, I, I, what I'd like to do is just, just to give you a sense of the uh, amusement and the largesse and the uniqueness of this man. I'd like to um, read just a, a little paragraph from a book I half wrote. I half wrote it with my... My classmate, Al Young, a late, the late poet laureate of California, who is an African-American poet, the editor of the school literary magazine. And all us kids were like, ah, we, were, we, followed, we would follow him anywhere, Mingus. And, uh, and he would ask us to edit his book, <laughs> Beneath the Underdog. It had another name then, I can't say it. Too dirty. But um, <laughs> read this little excerpt from this book. Um, I ran into him at the Ninth Circle one night late, oh, 25 years ago. The book was written in 1989. Um, I had introduced him to the Ninth Circle. Mickey Ruskin's bar before Max's Kansas City, and it was quite a sweltering, wonderful place, too. I ran into him at the Ninth Circle one night late, 25 years ago. He was dressed in a brown banker, banker's suit and vest, and he was drinking vintage wine. At closing time, he offered to escort me home if I would wait for him while he gets some, got some things he'd stored in the coat room. I thought he meant his top hat and cane. When he came out of the coat room, he was dressed in a yellow slicker suit with matching hat and boots. He had a bow and quiver on his shoulder and a suitcase in his hand. We walked to Balducci's. Then, be, prior to its life as a fancy gourmet deli on 6th Avenue and later in a bank, he, uh, we walked to Valducci's, which was then an all-night fruit stand, very modest Italian fruit stand, big but modest, on Greenwich Avenue, and stopped to buy some apples. I mean, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and we're buying apples there, and a street acquaintance there were, they, they were there, a street acquaintance of Mingus, passed uh, us by and asked him what was in the suitcase. Mingus opened it. It was full of extra arrows. <laughs> and these are some of them. These musicians are, or some of the arrows in that quiver, I'm pretty sure. Did he poison you with his arrow? <laughs> anyway, I'm so happy to be here to celebrate somebody who really changed my life and I think changed every musician's life who's played, played his music. So let me, do I announce him? You announce yourself. Okay. Don't wanna. Thank you, Janet. Next up is multiple Grammy Award winning bassist, multiple award winning educator, Mike Richmond. Mike, early in his career, uh, knew and worked with Charles Mingus, and when Mingus passed away, took over for him as the leader of the Mingus Dynasty Band. Uh, Mike has performed and recorded with Numerous notables such as Miles 
you know, you know, in the interest of time, just think of a big name jazz musician. You got it? He has played and recorded with all of them. Mike Richmond. Uh, Charles was one of the great, great bassists in jazz of all time. And I've been asked to speak briefly about technique and how he played the bass and how he was as a musician in the band. As a bass player, our main role is keeping time, which means if you have a piece of music that has four beats a bar, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Most bass players from the early 30s until Charles started getting in the scene in the late 40s and early 50s played something called quarter notes and a quarter note gets one beat. That's what the majority of bass players were playing at that time. Just to do a Reader's Digest version of this, that's what mainly people were playing on the bass. Charles decided to break up the time a little bit. So instead of playing straight quarter notes, he decided to play a little off the quarter note. There's something called triplets, and that means you're playing three notes in the space of one beat. So one beat would be one, two, three, four. A triplet would be ba 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 ba. Charles is one of the first bass players to play triplets in his bass line. So he sometimes did one triplet, multiple triplets, that had never been done before. So it sounds pretty simple now on West 3rd Street, or on Jones Street. It's, it's very matter of fact. But in the late 40s, no bass player was playing like that. It was a very avant-garde, rhythmically way to play. What he would do too in his compositions, and in other people's tunes, he would play eighth notes during the other soloists. So, instead of playing, we'll play triplets. And sometimes he would go. So he would almost be soloing from time to time during the other solos, and that's called counterpoint. He's playing one line, the soloist is playing another line. Bass players had never done that before, to that extent. And with harmony, also, if you're playing chords, and I'm sure people here know what a chord is, there's the bottom of the chord, so if you have an F chord, the bottom of the chord, the root of the chord is called an F. 
Charles didn't feel obligated to play the roots of the chords <clears throat> all the time. So he would play another note in the scale or the chord. So instead of going if the second chord was a B flat, which has a D, he might go. So he would play, like he would play melodically with his bass line, also changing the rhythm a little bit. So he was, not all the time, but more often than not, was playing counterpoint that Bach invented to the way he invented it. Uh, he was playing counterpoint through the melodies of the songs and through the melodies that the other soloists were playing. It sounds very normal now. This is the way most bass players play. <clears throat> but 60 or, 70, 60 or 70 years ago, that didn't happen. That would be like looking up in the sky and in 1948 seeing uh, a, a missile. You wouldn't see that. Or a little toy airplane flying in the air. It wasn't invented yet. So he was a harmonic inventor, a rhythmic inventor, a groove inventor. So he didn't always play very straight through his songs and other, other people's tunes. Um, and also, I used to see Charles play in the 60s uh, when I was in college. And he used to play a few blocks away at the Village Gate all the time. And uh, I'm from Philadelphia and I used to come up with my friends and see Charles play with his band. And one time, during a solo, he wanted to do something called <clears throat> tense. No, a tent is an interval. It sounds like. In this case, I'm playing a C and an E. It would be called a major third if they were closer to each other. to play a C and an E at the same time with the bow. So if you can see the way the bridge holding the strings. If you can see the way the bridge is shaped, it's curved. And uh, with the bow, if you're going to play an A, you want you to play them together. Can anybody here tell me how I can play these two notes together with the bow? And there's two strings in the middle that get in the way. Is there anybody that can figure out how I can play those two notes together? What's that? Well, you can't do it like that. You can't damp the strings in the middle. What Charles did was, he took his bow, he put them underneath the strings. So he could play the A at the same time. Now, it seems like a normal, natural thing to do. The coat hanger seems like it's very simple, too. But somebody had to invent it. Otherwise, it would be tripping all over the place. He was the first person that I know about that would play two notes in a row next to each other at the same time. And he took a solo underneath. It might sound pretty simple, and you don't seem too amazed. But that's a pretty, but that was a pretty big deal years ago. Instead of, instead of, we go underneath. When somebody invented the wheel a long time ago, I'm sure somebody else said, it's a waste of time, don't waste your time on that. It's a pretty big deal to invent a new technique. And well, my last comments will be, Charles could play the bass from the very low, Notes. 
to the higher positions, which is called thumb position, because he was classically trained. And most jazz bass players at that time, except for Slam Stewart and a few other people, didn't use the bow. And Charles knew how to get a beautiful classical sound, so he played in tune. So we could play low. Not many jazz bass players at the time were playing with the bow in thumb position in the upper register, either pizzicato with his finger. So he only used his forefinger, which is a classical technique. Yeah. For you as you would, you would pluck the bass like this. So Charles used the side of his forefinger and made a little bit longer sound. But he was one of the first people in jazz that could play classically to the end of the fingerboard while he was improvising and the lowest positions almost perfectly in tune all the time. So he was an inventor of many things in the bass, the way to create harmony, the way to play, the way to play a broken bass line, adding different rhythms in, triplets, or there's something called pull-offs, where you pull off on the string. He's one of the first inventors. It's very natural to do that now, but most people were playing shorter, quarter notes, more staccato, and four beats a bar. And he changed the rhythm up along with the harmony. Any quick questions before I go and somebody else please? That was amazing. Any quick questions about what I just said before somebody else takes over? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Composer, multi-instrumentalist Scott Robinson and trombonist Frank Lacey have been prominent and prolific uh, presences in the jazz scene for almost four decades, recording hundreds of albums, over half a dozen of them Grammy Award winning ones, and performing and recording with a who's who of musicians, not only in the jazz world, but in the music world at large. Scott and Frank. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Want to help me out with this? Can you turn it down a little bit? Thank you very much for being here, everybody. I just want to say a few words, a few quick words about Charles Mingus, uh, his significance as a composer. He ranks as one of the great composers in this music, or in any music. Uh, my opinion, he deserves to be spoken of in the same breath as Duke Ellington and Sun Ra, Eddie Harris, and some Thad Jones are some of the greatest composers we've had. Um, as a child, Growing up in Virginia, I heard Fables of Faubus on the radio and taped it onto a cassette and listened to it over and over and over. And it made a profound impression on me because it was so deeply heartfelt and 
the conviction in it was so strong on so many levels. A very strong melody, interesting form. Uh, the playing is obviously at a very high level. The soulfulness of it, the looseness in the feel, and the vocal exhortations and the yelling and shouting, um, the kind of crazed... Uh, manic uh, sarcasm that was in it and the depth of the political statement that he made. You know, nowadays we hear a lot of political music, but uh, Charles Mingus was one of the pioneers along with Max Roach and, and others. Of course, uh, these kind of statements were made earlier in a gentler way by people like Fats Waller and Andy Razaf, but uh, Boy, when you heard Mingus make a statement about right and wrong, it was very deep and very profound. And the political message, to my way of thinking, fed the music rather than the other way around. So Mingus's compositions, many of them can be as thorny and challenging as his outsized legendary personality. And I have to say, uh, at this point, I want to um, bring attention to his widow, Sue Mingus, who left this world uh, not that long ago. She was just named a jazz master by the National Endowment for the Arts, a very high honor. You can clap for that. And it is thanks to her efforts that his music is heard and performed to the degree that it is today all over the world by very young people, old people, everybody. Uh, it's a music for everyone. And she helped really make sure that every composer should be so lucky to have a Sue Mingus um, to champion their music after they're gone. Uh, so I want to express my gratitude to her. She was always here for the music, always listening to the band. She would go on the road with us. We went to Portugal. We went all over the place. and. Um, just in closing, I want to say, uh, I want to thank Juan and the Preservation Society because it's because of you guys that I found out coming down here today that this apartment where Mingus lived is directly across the street from where we used to play, and I had no idea. So now a lot of people will know, thanks to your plaque. But uh, I played in the band. It was my honor after being a kid, little kid hearing him on the radio. I got to play in the band, the posthumous Mingus band, for 30 and a half years, starting out right here in 19, February of 1992, right across the street there. Uh, there's been some changes, and uh, I'm no longer performing with the orchestra, but I'm very, very grateful for, to Sue for the time that I had uh, learning and performing this music. And now I want to introduce a very old, dear friend of mine, I should say, I didn't say that right, did I? He's not very old, but he's a very old friend of mine. We went to college together, great trombonist, French horn player, band leader, fabulous vocalist, and a really special guy. I'm a little bit jealous because he was on the cover of Downbeat, and I never will be. Frank, Wett, Frank uh, Lacey. Frank Lacey. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to stay too long. Uh, we got a, a, a nice uh, talk about Mingus to Miss Janet Coleman. And all you people that want to take a bass lesson, you had a great bass lesson here. From, uh, um, so they probably be coming to NY, NYU. But uh, I just wanted to, uh, I, know, uh, I know the last speaker, I'm at the back of the bus. So let me speak from the back of the bus. Um, um, I want to speak about Charles Mingus's impact on American society, okay? For one thing, it says, Art Blakey, who I played with, he used to say, uh, no America, no jazz. Charles Mingus was the embodiment of America. He was actually African American. He had Asian in him. He had Spanish in him. Uh, I think he had, he had some European in him. So uh, all of he, he embodied the whole thing. And historically, uh, he wrote this great piece, one of my favorite pieces. He played uh, Black Saint and the Center Lady. But uh, he also, uh, The Fables of Fabus, what happened in 1957 when uh, um, 
Or Governor Oberfarb was trying to keep black kids from going to school. And my father saw that on TV in 1957. He said, when I see that, I got questions about integration. So my next child, he's going to be my social experiment to integration. And I was born in 1958, OK? Um, he also, uh, he also, um, um, uh, they had questions of uh, meditations on a pair of wire cutters where uh, the uh, Japanese Americans in internment, uh, they were fenced in by the American government and he wrote a piece called uh, uh, Meditations on a Pair of Wire Cutters to, to cut yourself out of the prisons. He also, um, he also uh, wrote a piece about um, the um, Remember Rockefeller and Attica. The big uh, thing that happened, the big uh, 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 prison riot at Attica, where uh, he wrote, remember Rockefeller at Attica? He also wrote a piece uh, about, um, he was inspired by the man's fight to the moon, entitled Pinky, Don't Come Back from the Moon Man Looking for Love. You know, he, 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 I mean, this was Charles Mingus, and he was the embodiment of American society. He concerned, he was very concerned about. His people, the American people, without regard to race, creed, or national origin. And, um, and I remember I first got the gig over there. It's not there anymore, but the Time Cafe Fez in 1988. I distinctly remember Miss Joan Rivers making a dirty joke about me one time. It was, like, it was cool, you know, at least you, know, you got the great Joan Rivers to make a joke about you, huh? So uh, um, that's all I have to say. But the one last thing I have to say is that uh, I studied physics, right? And um, in our uh, 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 physics class, they said that uh, actually memory, basically, to the living being, memory is an electrical impulse in the medulla of the brain. So a person never really passes away because in the memory, you keep them in your memory. So. Uh, with, with, the Mingus, with the memory of Charles Mingus, all, you know, everyone remembers him. This even amplifies the living embodiment of this person. So uh, a person really never dies, if you can dig what I'm saying. All right, let's play some music, huh? Thank mm -hmm. you. 
I might, I get to follow that. <laughs> uh, the moment we've all been waiting for, Jenna. Charles Mingus, legendary jazz composer, band leader, multi-instrumentalist, and social activist. Charles Mingus lived here in 1966, a towering figure in American music. He fused and transcended musical genres and pushed the boundaries of bass playing and collective improvisation. A frequent performer at both major music festivals and renowned local jazz venues, Mingus cre created music noted for its experimentation and breathtaking melodic, wow. rhythmic, and structural originality. Plays by Village Preservation. Wow. We're now going to yeah. we're now going to gather around the plaque for pictures. I wanted to thank everyone uh, who we heard from uh, Janet, Mike, Scott, and Frank. I would also like to thank the wonderful residents of Five Great Jones. Uh, and the Village Preservation staff who made this possible, Dina, Sam, Shannon, Maya, uh, Jenna, Keelan, and Chloe. And a special thanks to Serge Osorgeron and Peter Fraga. Uh, and finally, thank you all for coming. If you like what we do, check us out at villagepreservation.org and consider becoming a member if you are not already one. Thank you.